Um, I'm, I'm very glad to be here and I really appreciate the, uh, the call from the Carpenters Company to, uh, to make this presentation today. I did not do this alone. No project is done alone. I don't have to tell anybody in this, in this audience that this, the Statue of Liberty uh, restoration in the mid 80s was, a, uh, was accomplished by a huge team. The National Park Service, and I was the uh, project architect on behalf of the National Park Service, uh, teamed with the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation, which is Park Service and the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation still exists today. The, uh, and the Statue of Liberty, for those of you in the, on the construction side of, uh, of preservation, the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation purchased and owned the actual uh, restoration work, which was then donated to the National Park Service. So for a period, the statue was, in a sense, turned over to, uh, to the foundation. Uh, the foundation was actually established uh, to, to uh, fund and execute the 100th anniversary celebration in 1986. Um, there was a prior foundation, which was a French foundation, which did the uh, the initial investigation on the statue that uh, didn't survive uh, didn't survive its own fundraising efforts, and as a result, the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island found at that time the Statue of Liberty Foundation uh, took over the construction as well as the celebration, and then eventually added uh, Ellis Island too to its portfolio as well. So there were a lot of people involved in this project. You'll see a lot of people in the, in the slides that I have. Um, but I want to, uh, oh, and uh, you know, these are, unlike a lot of people's uh, presentations, this, this presentation uh, builds on a lot of old material. I had never had a lot of, I have no slides that are scanned, so these are, old slides and old images uh, scanned for this presentation. So the quality varies, but you won't see a lot of this stuff anyplace else because it's all um, a product of my own camera. Um, icon, the, the word icon is in, this, uh, in the title of, this, uh, of my portion of the presentation. Uh, I'm doing the then portion of the, of the statue project and Michael Mills will do the now. Uh, I'm the before and Michael's the today. Not the after because it's not done yet. But the icon question, and I, I couldn't help but uh, use this slide. This is, uh, I, I had completely forgotten that I had this slide, that standing at the top of the, at the scaffolding that was above the, uh, the crown, the head of the statue, which is in the, in the bottom of the slide, looking at sunset toward, um, toward the uh, World Trade Center. So what is an icon? Some, some things are icons from the very beginning. Some things become icons uh, by, uh, in the case of the World Trade Center, cataclysmic, catastrophic events. Uh, the Statue of Liberty was an icon from the beginning. There was a presentation, I work at the, at the National Gallery of Art. There was a lecture last week. The lecturer defined icons as uh, loquacious artifacts, an artifact that continues to speak to people today. And the statue is, in fact, a very loquacious artifact as the World Trade Center has become a loquacious artifact. This is a two-page spread in the New York Times magazine, maybe weekend before last. This is a Chinese artist who is, the, the artist's career as a sculptor is focused completely on the Statue of Liberty. Um, this is the Statue of Liberty as Mao, attempting to address the Chinese people, in their, uh, in their idiom, the idiom of Maoism, and uh, to address uh, uh, topics of liberty to, to the Chinese. So this is, this is contemporary art based on the Statue of Liberty today. The, the iconic nature, the iconic character of the statue continues. So this is also a, a master builders program, the statue in the 1870s, 1880s involved three master builders, uh, one of whom was the mastermind among the master builders, and that is uh, Auguste Bartholdi, a, uh, a French um, sculptor from Alsace. Alsace is one of those areas uh, in Europe that switched, um, switched countries frequently, but at this time and since is, uh, is in France. Uh, Gustave Eiffel, a very well-known name to all of us, a French engineer, pioneered uh, iron and steel construction. 
uh, the Statue of Liberty predates uh, the Eiffel Tower, and in fact, the, the core tower of the statue is, uh, is in many ways, it's a, a small Eiffel Tower. And uh, Richard Morris Hunt, the uh, first American architect to complete the Beaux-Arts program in Paris, um, constructed uh, Newport Mansions, constructed the, the, the Metropolitan Museum that we, uh, that we see today, that followed the Calvert Vox Museum, um, and through connections in New York was selected to, uh, to design the pedestal on which the statue uh, was built. Bartoldi had a rough idea, as you'll see, of what the pedestal should look like, and then uh, um, Richard Morris Hunt made that real. Uh, this is Bartoldi in his, in his studio. You see a, a maquette of the statue on the, uh, on the left. Uh, the idea began as a, as a gift to the United States uh, in honor of its centennial in 1876. The, uh, the project was 10 years late. It was dedicated um, 125 years ago tomorrow on October 28th, um, 1886. But parts of it were here in Philadelphia for the Centennial Exhibition, as we'll see, in 1876. So in the 1870s, uh, Bartoldi came to New York, came to the United States for the first time in 1871 to tour the United States to see where uh, a monument to liberty could be located. And uh, Bartoldi went through, did his grand tour, grand tour of, uh, of the United States from east to west, from uh, uh, including the upper Midwest. Uh, Chicago, of course, this is uh, 1870s, was a, a very important mercantile city. And uh, in the end chose, um, chose New York as the place that he proposed to uh, this was still a proposal at that time and hadn't been uh, presented to the, to the U.S. government yet. The Statue of Liberty is a, um, a sort of a redo of what Bartoldi proposed for the entrance to the Suez Canal in the 1860s. This is the maquette for the, uh, for the, uh, for the monument at the Suez Canal. You see many things that are reminiscent uh, for one thing, all of Bartholdi's figures are right-handed, so the statue is right-handed. This is uh, this, uh, the next slide's back to front. You'll see it's uh, you'll see it should be right-handed. Um, the two you'll see other um, sculpture in New York. Uh, so this is his Suez Canal monument. This was uh, his rendering of uh, what the Suez Canal would be like. Uh, remember those rays coming out of, the, uh, out of the forehead in this case. Here's the Statue of Liberty. Uh, same rays coming out of the uh, forehead. This is Bartholdi's rendering of the statue um, in New York. And of course, this is the view. The view of the statue is not from Manhattan. The view of the statue is, is from the Atlantic. This was the statue is advancing to the world, liberty enlightening the world. Um, so the... This is the view that Bartholdi uh, presented to the United States government. Bartholdi, after uh, his first visit in 1871, he was commissioned for several works in Manhattan. One is a Lafayette. This is the base of the Lafayette uh, sculpture in, that's in, uh, in Union Square. There's a, a Lafayette and Washington in Upper Manhattan. And then for the uh, Philadelphia Centennial Exposition, he was commissioned for one of the, uh, commissioned one of the major fountains, and this is at the U.S. Botanic Garden in Washington today. So those are the th these are the three other Bartholdi works in the United States, other than uh, small pieces in museums. Uh, this is what Bartholdi saw. It was uh, sort of a tidal island, very small, uh, in the 1870s that had on it uh, a fort that had been constructed uh, between 1808 and 1811 as part of the fortifications a little late for the, uh, for the War of 1812. So uh, imagine that you're the US government. You're, in fact, the War Department. And the president and, his, and some of his cabinet members and aides are now telling you that you are going to demolish one of your, uh, the, a large part of one of your fortifications 
and a fellow from France will come and install a colossal copper statue. So the improbability of the Statue of Liberty in, in historical imagination is it's really quite stunning if you uh, try to imagine this today. So this is the interior of Fort Wood uh, prior to the construction of the statue. So inside of the star fort that still exists today was the actual operational fort. And this is the uh, parade ground inside of Fort Wood. Uh, the statue began construction outside uh, in, uh, in Paris. There was a, a workshop, uh, Gaget Gautier was the, uh, was the fabricator for the Statue of Liberty. Parts were created inside and then uh, assembled outside. Uh, here's a, a view, uh, newspaper view, of the interior of the Gaget Gautier uh, workshop. The first portion completed was the, uh, was the arm and the torch and the flame. And that visited Philadelphia again in 1876 for the Centennial Exhibition. It was then returned to Paris, slightly adjusted and installed on the statue, which was still under construction in Paris. Then disassembled, crated, and shipped to the United States, where it waited for the pedestal to be uh, pedestal to be completed on the island. So here is the um, here's the beginnings, uh, the the lower portion of the pedestal. The pedestal is mass concrete, no uh, no no reinforcing. What you see are the the barrels of cement. Uh, unused barrels stacked at the fort wall, and then the, uh, the refuse barrels of cement uh, tossed over the, over the edge. And in order to construct this, you see the, which was common in large construction projects, uh, you see the small railway that was constructed to transport materials from the, uh, from the dock uh, to the construction site. Pedestal rising. So when it was completed, this is an 18, uh, 18, 1830s photograph. This is a 1930s photograph. Uh, this is at the time that the, the Park Service um, took over the, the Statue of Liberty National Monument, which had been declared probably improperly by the War Department in 1915. Um, it's a little shady on why the War Department would have declared the statue a national monument, but it was uh, later confirmed through the Department of the Interior as a national monument. But you see that even when the Park Service took it over, uh, took, was assigned the site at the time that Roosevelt, um, FDR, transferred a lot of military sites to the National Park Service in the 30s, uh, it was at that time still a, an active military base. So that the National Monument in 1915 was the statue and its pedestal. That was it. And in the 1930s, uh, Roosevelt expanded the, the National Monument designation to the whole island as part of the transfer to the National Park Service. In preparation, this, uh, the work in the 1980s was not the first major work. Soon after the statue, the statue was never intended as a, a site for public visitation. So there was nothing inside the statue except its own structure when it was completed in uh, 1886. But soon after, um, 1887, 88, 89, uh, the initial stairway was constructed inside so that people could reach the crown and could reach the, the balcony around the, at the upper part of the torch. Uh, so that was the initial phase of the construction. There really were no visitor facilities because, again, that you were visiting on a, uh, on a military base. So the visitors were sort of shunted right into the statue and uh, took their visit and left. Um, in the 1930s, in preparation for the 50th anniversary of the statue, it's, a, it's interesting how young it is because, of course, icons, that's part of being an icon is it seems like it's been there forever. Um, it, so in the 1930s, the, in 1936, the statue was only 50 years old, and the Park Service undertook the first restoration, uh, really extensive repair of the statue, uh, which 
was uh, principally focused on repairing particularly deteriorated iron bars which formed the armature which supported the skin. So in the 1930s, selective uh, replacement of the armature was undertaken. Um, a, uh, a forge was set up on Liberty Island. Not, it, this almost parallels exactly the work in the 1980s. A forge was established on Liberty Island and uh, bars were removed, bar on the left, a bar removed from the, uh, from the statue and reproduced in iron again on the, uh, on the right. You see the, uh, the, the fort buildings in the background. Uh, this, all of the work uh, in the 1930s was, this is a significant difference between the 1930s and the 1980s work, is that all of the work in the 1930s was done without scaffolding. scaffolding. You'll see the small scaffolding that was built to protect the visitors, but otherwise the work was done with, uh, in bosun's chairs uh, hanging off of the top of the statue. This is uh, removing, without scaffolding, the, the, the copper rays, copper and bronze rays from the, uh, from the diadem of the statue, taking them in, down, repairing the, uh, the iron inside, uh, replacing the iron inside and reinstalling them again from the inside. Uh, also at this time, uh, the, the configuration of the stairs was changed. The statue was a very popular um, visitation, uh, site for visitation and the, the stairs were changed and the first elevator was installed. That uh, required more space inside the pedestal. So the jackhammering is increasing the opening in the, the central opening in the pedestal uh, by removing the concrete. And a little more space was required in the 1980s and the exact same thing was done again. So there, so now we're getting into the 1980s project. So here's the, the bit of scaffolding that was built to uh, really to protect the visitors on the top of the pedestal and uh, to continue allow visitation there. But one of the first, and you know, the statue project in the 1980s, uh, it depends on what your own interests are because there's, uh, there's a bit of something for everybody. If you're a scaffolding enthusiast, this was, uh, the, the, this was a performance spec for the spe scaffolding, which was that the scaffolding had to allow the removal of the flame, which determined how tall it had to be. And the scaffolding could not touch the, uh, the sta it had to allow access to the statue within 12 inches, but it could not touch the statue or anchor in any way to the statue. So above the pedestal itself, to which the statue was uh, sort of pressed against, I mean, the scaffolding was pressed against, above the pedestal, the scaffolding is freestanding. And the, uh, this engineering was done by Universal Builder Supply. Um, in, the, in the 1980s, the work that had been done in the 1930s, in large part, many of the, the, the failed um, armature bars were bars that had been replaced in the 1930s because the runoff of water on the interior of the statue hadn't changed. So you had the same deterioration in the same locations uh, as in the 1930s, but of course there were more locations. So the, uh, this is looking up the arm and you see how complicated this is. Uh, please also bear in mind that the 1980s project began in the fall of 1983 and Ronald Reagan rededicated the statue in, on July 4th, 1986. So in that time, all of the armature on the interior of the statue was removed and replaced. The very smallest workers were used, <laughs> were used, that's the good word, to uh, access the inside of the tablet on the statue, which is only a, uh, you know, a little two foot space. And the arm, no armature was, none of the original armature was left. Every uh, bit of the iron armature was replaced with stainless steel. Again, you see how, uh, how closely the armature follows the shape of the skin. So in the 1980s, same as in the 1930s, the uh, existing armature bars were removed 
and uh, recreated in, to match in stainless steel. The stainless steel was uh, selected with the assistance of uh, Texas Instruments. This is Bob Baboyan, a metallurgist with Texas Instruments at the, uh, the outdoor weathering site, which is probably, it could still be there today, which these are all the choices of materials that were considered for the uh, replacement armature. The, uh, the final material is ferallium, which was a high nickel content uh, stainless steel produced by Cabot. Uh, again, the, the, the replacement armature was uh, produced on site in a workshop that was built on site. Another portion of the project, which was uh, uh, as delicate as recreating the, the armature piece by piece, was repairing the skin, because of course now you really are dealing with the, uh, with the very fabric of the icon. And over time, you'll, this is the bottom of a curl on the, uh, at the uh, neck of the statue. And uh, water intrusion had uh, eroded the copper that it just it fell apart. So in very select, in about a dozen select uh, positions, the actual skin of the statue was replaced. This is the workshop of P.A. Fiebiger in New York. That's Joe Fiebiger. On the far left of the slide, you see the replacement tip for that, uh, for that curl, which then they sawed off the, uh, the bottom of the existing curl at a joint line. The, in investigating how the statue skin was, uh, was constructed, there are really two kinds of joints. On the general work, which would be sort of the, uh, the robe, uh, it's all lap joints. It's a simple lap, riveted lap joint. On the more finely sculpted uh, work, it is a planished joint where uh, uh, sawtooth edge meets sawtooth edge. It is the traditional uh, French way of installing the bottom on a pot. And uh, that is exactly how the, in the more sculptural portions of the statue, the, the uh, sheets were uh, connected one to the other, and so that is how the uh, then the tip of this curl was reinstalled, just like you would install the bottom on a pot. Uh, one of the problems on the interior, of course, was water intrusion, and uh, the project was dedicated to doing something about that, not that it could cure all of the problems, but associated with that was the, uh, was the great number of coating layers on the interior of the statue. Sometime in the 1890s, probably, the statue was first coated with, uh, with coal tar. And subsequent to that, just as part of maintenance in order to keep the statue looking fresh, layer after layer of paint was, uh, was installed. Um, all the early layers, of course, were, were, uh, were lead paint. So we already had an asbestos problem because the original constructed use, construction used asbestos sheets to insulate the iron bars from the copper skin. Uh, that was handled as part of removing and replacing the armature. But the idea of, um, of making lots of little particles of, uh, of, of lead airborne within an enclosed space uh, was a, and a, a real, as part of removing the material, was a real ab abatement problem. So we searched for ways that we would not increase the volume, uh, because we're on an island, uh, that we would not increase the volume of the hazardous waste with, uh, with whatever medium we would use to blast the, uh, the paint off of the inside of the skin. So the, the final choice was liquid nitrogen because the liquid nitrogen would fracture the coatings in, within the coal tar layer. So we had half the coal tar layer left at the end of the nitrogen removal treatment, but we had no greater volume than just the paint itself. We didn't have sand, we didn't have rice hulls, we didn't have whatever one might choose. So this was what we the whole point was to reduce the volume of hazardous materials that had to be handled in the statue on the island and transported off the island. So this was the liquid nitrogen treatment. Union Carbide set up a, uh, a huge liquid nitrogen plant, supply plant on the island in order to supply 
um, liquid nitrogen for a uh, process that at this point was going 24-7. There were people up there with wands uh, blasting away with a shower of, uh, of, of uh, fractured coating coming down continuously. This was the final effect. This is with the copper skin clean down to copper. Uh, the, the final removal of the, uh, of the coal tar was with solvent, uh, was with first with uh, um, pulverized walnut shells and then with, uh, with solvent for the final clean. And this is the, with the clean skin with the new stainless steel armature. Another uh, sort of sensitive portion of the project was the replacement of the, of the flame. In 1886, within months of the statue's ded uh, dedication in New York Harbor, the statue was turned over. It had to have a bureaucratic home. And it was turned over to the Lighthouse Board, which immediately needed to find a use. It had to be a navigational aid. So the Lighthouse Board began cut. The, the, flame, the original flame was constructed the same way as the rest of the statue, continuous copper sheets. The Lighthouse Board began cutting First, one row of holes at, with an electric light on the inside, and then a second row of holes, and then a third row of holes. The statue never qualified. At, the, the strength of the, of the light coming out of all of these holes never did qualify the statue as a navigational beacon. And uh, eventually, in the 1930s, the, um, the flame was turned over to Gutzum Borglum, the sculptor of Mount Rushmore, to come up with a new idea of uh, how, the how the flame could look. And uh, Borglem both cut apart the flame as well as cut into the flame to uh, install colored glass, uh, darker at the bottom, lighter at the top, and new lighting on the interior. And of course, this is the flame that many of us grew up with and was the flame for the Statue of Liberty. For all we knew, that's the way it was done. Uh, the, this was a, a source of uh, water intrusion, and it was, it was literally falling apart at this point. So either the choice would have been to replace, reproduce the Borglum flame, or to reproduce the, uh, the original flame. This goes um, to Mr. Milner's uh, points earlier. And the decision was to recreate the original flame. This is a, a model that's about eight inches long. This is a plaster cast from the original clay maquette of a solid skin flame. Working on that, uh, then the contractor, Le Metallier Champenois, which has an office in uh, Patterson, New Jersey now, uh, they were from, they were exclusively from France at that time. They made the next size version of the flame, they made the next size version of the flame, and they made the full size version of the flame. And what you see is the stainless steel, stainless steel armature for the new flame, for which there was no existing model, being created against the plaster full size version of the flame. Uh, this work was done in ray poussé, which means the copper is uh, hammered on both sides. Uh, in a workshop on, uh, on Liberty Island. Both the flame and the upper portion of the torch, which is in the background, were reproduced. In about 24 to 48 hours, um, the flame was gilded. The two choices of gilding that were considered by the project were electroplating and uh, gold leafing. Uh, electroplating, there's two types or so I understand, or so I recall. Two types, one is tank, where you could install it, which did not exist for an object this size. And the other is um, that you can use a wand, an electric wand, create a charge on the, on the substrate, and with a bottle of gold in solution, you can plate gold slowly but surely onto the surface. It's, it is nearly impossible to do that upside down because you're spraying the the gold on. It works very well above, but not from below. The flame, at this point, this was too difficult to turn this thing over. And, um, and a father and son team was brought from Paris, and they varnished it one day. That's what you see as sort of the dull matte. That is a, uh, a tinted varnish. 
as the base for the uh, as a base for the gilding, and that sat overnight, and then they gilded it uh, within a day. The father and son working together. There are not a lot of photographs of this because they did it in a tent because of the uh, air movement. Liberty Island's a very windy place, uh, and there are not a lot of good shots. But this this gives you a sense of uh, of what they were doing. It worked. Here's the, uh, the new flame uh, sitting next to the old in the workshop in which all of this was done. That actually has snow on it, if you looked. Uh, new York is uh, quite an aggressive environment. And even, um, even in such an aggressive environment, I understand that the gold leaf is, uh, is holding up very well. There were wear, quick wear tests done, uh, again, by Texas Instrument. Uh, instruments in order to determine whether electroplating and gold leafing were in any way comparable as far as wearability is concerned. And, in, and the, uh, the gold that the French proposed to use for this, which is hand fabricated, is in fact a particularly dense surface. And the, um, the difference, there was obviously a difference between electroplating wearability and, uh, and the wearability of gilding but it didn't tip it that, uh, toward either not doing any gilding, which was also a choice, because it was not 100% clear that, uh, that it was 100% clear that Bartholdi intended the whole statue to be gilded, and then intended at least part of the statue, the flame, to be gilded. But it was not 100% clear that this was ever completed, but it was done for this project. It is reversible, but no one's chosen to reverse it yet. <laughs> And that's the, uh, that's the flame. That's, this is the then. And I haven't talked much about uh, the stairs and the elevators and safety concerns, because you will find out in a moment that all of that following 9-11 uh, 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 has been rethought. And the person that's in charge of that rethinking is Michael Mills. Yeah, like, uh, like John, I'm not in charge of the, uh, of the project, but uh, I am uh, privileged to be the, um, uh, the architect and head of a multidisciplinary design team uh, that, is, that is working now at the statue. Uh, that includes uh, Keiston Hood, uh, Hughes Associates, fire protection consultants, Joseph Loring, engineers, uh, the lighting practice of Philadelphia, and RBA, uh, civil engineers, and I'm sure I'm leaving a lot of other people out. Um, so uh, what has happened since uh, John has completed his work? Well, uh, thankfully, uh, the work that they, they did uh, is in great shape. The statue itself is, is really weathering well and wearing well. And uh, all of that, that stainless steel uh, is, is still in, in, in terrific shape. Uh, but what has happened uh, since the 1980s is that uh, millions uh, of visitors, um, at least Seven million a year, I believe, is the current uh, figure, and it's intended to, it's probably going to increase. So uh, under that kind of onslaught, you know, the finishes wear out, uh, materials uh, change and wear. The mechanical equipment in the statue is uh, nearing the end of its life. There are new code requirements for accessibility and uh, egress. And um, uh, of course, 9-11 happened. And, uh, and since that, um, uh, well, various things happen. New, new sensibilities about uh, public safety and, uh, and what can happen in an event like that. And uh, actually, the Crown Access uh, had, was closed at 9-11 and uh, after 9-11 and never reopened. Uh, the Pedestal Access was also closed, uh, and, but was reopened a, a few years later. Um, let's see, how do you go forward? Here we go. Um, so the, our, our project goals of the current project, and I'll, I'll be, uh, be very brief and try to focus just on the, on the main elements of the design uh, to, try to try to keep on schedule, uh, but they are to basically improve life safety and code compliance, uh, preserve historic fabric while doing that, improve the visitor experience, uh, and improve accessibility, and make a more efficient and maintainable structure. Uh, the monument terminology, uh, there are nine levels uh, at, in the statue itself, and there's seven levels in the pedestal. 
Most of our current work is, is in fact, all of our current work is in the, in the pedestal, except for some mechanical equipment uh, for the statue itself. Uh, the pedestal is a granite-faced uh, concrete structure. Uh, it sits in the middle, whoops. Uh, it sits in the middle of Fort Wood. Uh, and the top of Fort Wood, that level is called the Terraplane. Uh, and that's a, a public uh, access point. Um, uh, the, um, it also has modern construction here called uh, the AMI space, which was the American